Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. It's a pleasure to put this webinar for you. And uh, now as we celebrate a week of cannabis becoming legal, there's a lot to do, a flurry of activity, but there's also some confusion out there and some questions that we're hoping to clear up. Uh, my name is Farouk Gafik. I'm a partner at our leasing group. I'm joined here by Jeremy Burke in our corporate commercial group and Tom Holinsky in our municipal group. So Jeremy will start first with some uh, regulatory and licensing issues. Tom uh, will cover municipal issues, and I will deal with some commercial leasing issues. Jeremy, on to you. Thanks, Farouk. Good morning, everybody. Um, so before we uh, dive into producer licensing by the federal government and retail licensing by the provinces, I thought it would make sense to give sort of a, a quick primer on the regulatory, the overall regulatory landscape. So generally speaking, all three levels of government participate in the cannabis regulatory framework. Uh, I'll be leaving municipal matters to, to Tom and to you as well, Farouk, uh, a bit later on. but. Just quickly on the Federal Cannabis Act jurisdiction and on provincial jurisdiction. So most of you, you know, this is probably not news to most of you, but the Federal Act regulates the production, distribution, and possession uh, of cannabis uh, and also the sale of medical cannabis. Um, beyond creating the licensing regime, though, the, the Federal Act also, you know, the goal is to supplant the illegal cannabis market and also uh, a key goal, key policy goal uh, of the, uh, the, the announced by the government is to limit exposure of young persons to the drugs. So to that effect, the Federal Act designates certain activities as criminal offenses that are subject to fines or imprisonment. Um, and the Federal Act also includes uh, highly restrictive promotion and advertising rules, packaging and labeling requirements, and sort of a whole host of, uh, of restrictive uh, provisions that aim to uh, accomplish those goals, limiting exposure to, to youth and uh, replacing the illicit cannabis market with a legal one. Um, with respect to licensing, federal licensing specifically, the old uh, ACMPR uh, has been essentially recreated as part 14 of the cannabis regulations, which are the regulations made under the Cannabis Act. Um, which is good because that means that there's substantive continuity between the federal licensing regime that was in place before April 17th and the current licensing regime. Uh, it's also useful to, to note, and this, will, this is something that's the source of a fair bit of confusion amongst uh, the public, is that there's currently only five forms, I guess, of cannabis that are, that are authorized to be um, uh, produced and distributed, and those are uh, cannabis seeds, cannabis plants, dried flour, fresh flour, and cannabis oil or, or resin. Um, regulations that are going to be uh, brought in to govern the commercial production of edibles are expected, expected to be in place by October of next year, uh, but currently the only legal edibles are those that uh, uh, consumers can create in their in their own houses. You can. Uh, there's no problem with uh, purchasing legal uh, cannabis oil and then or or flour and using it to create your own edibles. So that's sort of the the federal act generally. The federal act expressly delegates authority to the provinces to regulate the sale of recreational cannabis, and I emphasize that just to make sure that people are keeping in mind that the sale of medical cannabis is exclusively uh, regulated by the federal government. Um, but the, pr the provinces are expressly authorized to create legislation that regulates the sale of recreational cannabis, provided that the provincial legislation does a few particular things, which they all do, including prohibiting sales to young persons, uh, requiring that provincially authorized retailers uh, only purchase cannabis that's been produced by a federal licensee, obviously, and re also requiring that retailers take measures to reduce the risk of diversion of uh, uh, diversion to of legal cannabis to the illicit market. So that would be um, uh, uh, the market uh, supply where uh, 
um, illicit suppliers supply consumers rather than provincial, rather than through provincial operations, provincial license operations. So in addition to that express delegation for, uh, to regulate the sale of recreational cannabis, the provinces also have the authority to regulate um, all, all matters that are sort of ancillary to that sale and distribution of recreational cannabis, including the tra how cannabis can be transported in the province, permitted places of consumption, and things of that nature. The provinces are also acknowledged to have the power to, uh, for example, raise the minimum age. Uh, the federal act specifies that anyone 18 or older can uh, possess cannabis. Um, so m many of the provinces have raised that age to 19. Uh, provincial legislation can also lower the home grow limit or eliminate the right to, uh, to grow at home and also reduce the possession limits. The provinces uh, wouldn't uh, be able to increase possession limits. That would probably set up a, um, a, a dispute uh, that would need to be litigated between federal and provincial jurisdiction, but um, they can certainly reduce possession limits. Uh, one last note on the, on the regulatory framework, in addition to the municipal, municipal level of government having certain uh, um, regulatory powers. The CRA also has jurisdiction here, uh, and the CRA uh, licenses any federal licensed producer that cultivates, produces, or packages cannabis. Uh, they require any, any of those LPs to obtain a cannabis license from the CRA, and that's related to the excise duty regime. Um, which is uh, sort of beyond the, beyond the scope of this particular webinar, but um, I'm sure it's something that uh, licensed producers or applicants are, are or will be aware of. So there's three general models. Moving on to, to provincial, the, the actual overview of provincial distribution, there's three general models, an all-public model, an all-private model, or a hybrid model, and the hybrid model uh, refers to a, a mix of retail sales by government and private businesses. Generally, that means uh, private retailers for physical sales or you know bricks and mortar sales, and government for online sales. And here's a uh, somewhat busy uh, chart that sets that out for the different for all 13 jurisdictions in Canada. I'm not going to go through this in detail, but you'll note that. There's only two provinces, two jurisdictions that have gone fully private. That's Manitoba and Saskatchewan. And that includes also for wholesale distribution. So that would be the stage where the, the, the stage between um, the retail sale and licensed producer production. Um, Manitoba and Saskatchewan both have that being done entirely by private licensed uh, uh, distributors or retailers. Five uh, provinces, six provinces rather, six jurisdictions have gone fully public. Uh, most of them are smaller jurisdictions plus Quebec. And the other five are all, have all adopted a hybrid model for retail distribution, including three of, three of our four largest markets, uh, Alberta, BC, and Ontario have all gone uh, hybrid, and, general, and for all of those, that, that means that um, private retail options, it'll be private retail for bricks and mortar and uh, government only for online sales. So digging into Ontario in, in particular, um, it's a hybrid model, as I just covered. And the, the, just some basics of the, of the regulatory model for Ontario. So the AGCO, the Alcohol and Gaming Commission of Ontario, will be the regulator. A, the AGCO already regulates um, alcohol, gaming, and also horse racing. So it's got a lot of the, the necessary infrastructure that it'll need to take on regulation of cannabis retail. It's uh, the same structure that um, other provinces have gone with, is to use their liquor licensing body. Uh, to regulate cannabis retail as well. So the AGCO is going to require uh, anyone who wants to uh, operate a retail cannabis store in Ontario to obtain essentially three separate licenses or authorizations. A cannabis uh, retail operator license, that's a license for the individual. 
uh, or for the individual or corporation that will actually uh, operate the store, it'll, they'll need a separate store authorization for each location and uh, individuals performing essentially management functions within a particular cannabis, cannabis store will also have to be licensed with a cannabis manager retail license. Um, in terms of timing, the, uh, you, you can't apply for a store authorization until you've applied for or obtained an operator license. So that's the basic uh, retail structure. I'm going to jump to operator eligibility before I get into licensing characteristics. because I think it's important to understand you know, who's likely to be successful in obtaining a, a license. Um, we're still waiting for the regulations under the Cannabis License Act to be published. So there's going to be additional information to come. Once those regulations are published, which are expected for or you know, we'd speculate will be out by late November, hopefully. Um, at that point, the AGCO applications and their application processes will be finalized and published as well. But we do know some things already about the, the proposed regulatory re regime for cannabis uh, retail licensing. It's good, generally, it's gonna, it does bear significant similarity to liquor sales licensing, which makes sense uh, given that you know, both of these products implicate health and, health and safety concerns and also have historical ties to, to organized crime. So as with liquor licensing, the cannabis licensing process will mean comprehensive, will include comprehensive personal disclosure requirements for directors, officers, and shareholders of applicant corporations, probably only significant shareholders, but that remains to be seen, remains to be determined. And there'll also be numerous location-specific conditions, which uh, Tom's going to cover uh, shortly. Um, the AGCO will refuse to issue a license if there's a negative assessment of the applicant's likely financial responsibility, ability to comply with licensing rules, honesty, or integrity. Uh, and it's important to note that if the applicant is a corporation, which it definitely should be, no one should be operating a public-facing business like this uh, on, on a personal level, they should be doing it through a corporation. The AGCO uh, will also consider the character, financial history, and expected competence of the corporation's directors, officers, and shareholders, as well potentially as persons who are, quote, interested in the applicant or the proposed retail application, uh, retail location, pardon me. Persons who are interested could include uh, anyone that has a direct or indirect potentially control over the applicant's business or, or its financing. So. That'll, that'll include, for example, if your retail location is leased, um, that'll include your landlord. Your landlord may be subject to AGCO scrutiny. And that's really intended to give AGCO the tools to uh, mitigate the risk that organized crime or other you know, unlawful players are pulling strings in the you know, now legal cannabis industry. Uh, the AGCO will also refuse an application where the ap applicant has been convicted of an offense under the new cannabis legislation, federal or provincial, um, or if the AGCO believes that the applicant is still carrying on, uh, still participating in the illicit cannabis market. So if the conclusion is that the applicant or someone interested in the applicant is still operating uh, uh, an unlicensed dispensary, That'll that'll be uh, that that you, that'll be the death knell for your retail license. Um, so just a, a quick tip there: given the disclosure requirements, it, it it would be a good idea to simplify your corporate structure. Um, the the disclosure requirements will generally generally go all the way up the chain to individuals who are in control of corporations or, or holding corporations. So best to, to keep the, the structure minimal and save yourself some effort. Um, quickly, very quickly on license features, you know, once you have your license, what you need to do is commence operations within a year. You can't uh, sit on the license. You have to be operating within a year. Uh, you'll only be able to sell cannabis purchased from licensed producers and certain items prescribed by the regulations, which will likely be the same sorts of accessories that the Ontario Cannabis Store is offering to uh, purchasers online right now. Um, you'll have to renew your license periodically. We don't know yet how often that'll be, but I'd speculate it'll be every two or three years at the most. 
And uh, if, you're, if a store authorization is revoked or suspended for some reason, you've opened yourself, if you have multiple stores, to having all of your stores uh, revoked. All of your store authorizations revoked or suspended. So I'm moving pretty slowly, so I'm very quickly going to talk uh, to uh, the federal license holder regime. So currently there's 132 licensed producers, 69 of these are, are in Ontario, but there are thousands of, um, uh, of licensed producer applications in the queue. Uh, the Health Canada was, was supposed to be gearing up for a couple of years to improve application, pro, pro, application processing time, but you know, all, all indications point to them still being totally overwhelmed and uh, often unresponsive to requests, though uh, if you're in the queue already or a licensed producer, you're, it'll be easier to get their attention. Um, as anyone with a license or that's in the application queue likely already knows, the, the Federal Cannabis Act deems that a license granted uh, or an application made under the old ACMPR is deemed to be a license or an application under the new Cannabis Act. There shouldn't be a need to reapply if you're already in the queue. Um, and generally on the application process, so the you know, paper forms are gone, unless you like that sort of thing, and there's still an option for that. Uh, applications, though, can now be submitted online through the CTLS website, the Cannabis Tracking and Licensing System website. Um, and for anyone who's thinking about applying, uh, there's a pretty helpful uh, cannabis licensing application guide that Health Canada publishes, and that's probably a good place for you to start to understand what's required for the application. Once you get your application in, the process uh, includes, a, it more or less goes as follows, an initial screening to make sure the application is complete. Once it's complete, uh, then Health Canada undertakes a detailed review and uh, a security clearance process. And it's at that stage that there can be significant, and other stages, that there can be significant back and forth on the substance of the application. But once the application is in good shape, the ap applicant then has to demonstrate that the proposed facility is functional and you know, doing what the application says it's going to be doing. Uh, and that may necessitate a, an inspection, but there are opportunities to avoid an, an inspection if you've done a a uh, suitable uh, you know, video walkthrough uh, and, and otherwise satisfied Health Canada that you're ready to go. And then the initial license is issued. Um, once that's all ready, the initial license can, you know, at the, to getting to that stage can require up to a couple of years potentially, depending on the amount of back and forth required with Health Canada. It's been that slow. And it's important to note that for cultivation or processing license, licenses in particular, um, before you can start generating material uh, for bulk sales, you'll need to have your license amended uh, to obtain authorization to, uh, to make bulk sales to other licensed producers, for example, or to pr provincially authorized retailers. Um, uh, and this is because Health Canada uh, does further inspections and further checks to ensure that you're operating in compliance with good production practices and other, any other licensing issues are addressed. Uh, very rapidly on key considerations. Um, so once you've got your business plan ready to go, or maybe even before, um, you'll, you'll want to line up your location. That's probably uh, the, the, the best place to start. Um, and you'll want to be considering you know, zoning approaches taken in potential host municipalities. Tom will uh, talk more about that in a bit. Um, and then it's important for you to do two things. One is, the first probably, is decide on which license class or classes and license subclasses you need. Um, certain classes can be applied for in combination, um, but that depends on which classes you'll need. Um, and then the other really important thing to do very quickly is identify anyone who's going to require security clearance. Um, everyone, both the applicant um, and each of those individuals who require a security clearance need to open their own account with uh, the, the CTLS, and you want to start that process so that uh, once your application is ready to submit, those are all already in process. Um, starting that early will, will minimize delays. There's, there's uh, a number of license application uh, inclusions that I was going to go over, but I, I'm way over my own my time, so... 
Um, the last point I'll make, and, and this, this <laughs> inevitably will sound sort of self-serving, but another early step you should take is to line up the consultants that you'll want to work with. Um, obviously, you know, there are dedicated cannabis consultants that sort of offer, you know, one-stop shopping, and the good ones definitely know what they're doing, um, and if you're not adverse to the costs, uh, they're a good potential option. Those contracts, I've seen some of those contracts. Some of them are um, surprising. They're, they're generally, it's, you know, sort of par for the course for them to be six figures or more. Um, for people who are comfortable doing a bit more of their own, uh, a bit more work on their own, believe it or not, a less, expen a less, a less expensive option could be uh, law firms like A and B that have significant uh, cannabis regulatory expertise. We can do more pinpoint assistance or, or more comprehensive support if needed, and also make introductions and coordinate with technical experts if needed. Um, and similarly for retail licensing, uh, I actually just spoke to a contact uh, in Ontario who mentioned that he had been um, talking to uh, retail licensing consultants here, and uh, they were one of them was asking for as much as, as $40,000 to coordinate a retail license application, which sort of blew my mind. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what you get for that, but you know, based on my licensing experience with the AGCO, uh, that's not necessarily a cost-effective option. Um, so that pretty much covers everything I wanted to cover, and uh, I think we have a poll question uh, coming up for you now, and we'll take a few seconds so you guys can answer the poll. Thanks very much. Good morning, everybody, and thanks, Jeremy. I, my name is Tom Halinski, and I'm uh, in the Land Use and Municipal Group. And Jeremy has been kind enough to take you through the federal and provincial level of regulation. I want to turn to the municipal level. And there are really four topics that I wanted to talk about uh, quickly, some of them more quickly than others. The first one is going to be municipal licensing. Secondly, and these are really two parts of the same topic, uh, zoning with respect to cannabis production facilities and retail stores. And fourthly, just a few words about uh, the building code and other municipal regulations that I think everybody needs to keep in mind when they're looking at uh, uh, these facilities, whether from the perspective of the municipal uh, authority or an applicant or somebody looking to, to invest. And this story is really as much about what municipalities can't do uh, as, as it is about what they can do. The, the ground here has shifted very dramatically uh, since the new government has come in so that anything that you heard before is going to be more or less out of date in terms of uh, municipal regulation. Um, anything that you heard in the first half of the year is going to not be current uh, for the most part. Uh, the, the important thing to remember about municipal regulation is that municipalities are so-called creatures of statute. What that means is that they only have the powers that are given to them in a statute um, by the province. Uh, and I'm going to focus, focus specifically on the Ontario context because that's, that's what I know about and, uh, and, uh, and, and give you some um, broad descriptions as well as some examples of how municipalities are approaching this. <clears throat> so generally municipalities can regulate both uh, businesses in terms of licensing and land use and the latter is usually through zoning and primarily zoning bylaws and they do that under a number of statutes, uh, usually the Municipal Act and the Planning Act and obviously in Toronto under the City of Toronto Act. Um, what's, what's really important to remember is that f those powers have been quite substantially uh, modified and restricted by the Cannabis License Act in both respect of licensing and land use controls, uh, so zoning for uh, retail stores. Firstly, in terms of business licensing, municipalities have general authority to pass bylaws requiring uh, licenses, and you see examples of that all over the place from the retail licenses that you see hanging in, in establishments to the, the card on the side of a hot dog vendor to uh, a taxi license. 
In the case of, of cannabis, the, the Act has made it very clear that municipalities don't have the power to create a licensing regime with respect to the sale of cannabis, uh, <clears throat> and that that system falls completely within provincial jurisdiction. So from the point of view of municipalities, while they're the ones dealing with a lot of the, the direct on the ground uh, issues, impacts, and and considerations. They have very few of the controls, at least from a from a business um, licensing control perspective. Secondly, uh, turning to zoning, in terms of cannabis production facilities, and I'll, I'll talk about retail stores in a minute. Um, as you've heard, cannabis uh, production facilities are licensed by the federal government. Um, before submitting an application to the government, applicants have to provide written notice to the municipality in the area where this is going to be or proposed to be located. And uh, a municipality, generally speaking, has the power to regulate uh, cannabis production facilities through its zoning bylaws. Now, zoning bylaws, for those of you not involved in, in, in planning law, uh, are pretty broad um, instruments that, that are the main uh, tool through which municipalities regulate land use and they can be general or quite specific they can regulate how land can be used so what goes in what zones uh, you know, commercial residential industrial to where buildings and other structures can be located how tall they can be how dense they can be uh, what types of buildings uh, regulating lot sizes and dimensions, parking, loading requirements, storage requirements, uh, and setbacks, which is, which is an, important, uh, an important issue to keep in mind. In terms of uh, cannabis, still cannabis production facilities, um, what, uh, what municipalities have often done, <clears throat> uh, or at least are considering doing, uh, is to pass zoning bylaws that permit uh, production facilities in some zones but not other zones. And there's a lot of disagreement out there that's, that's not currently resolved over what type of zones facilities, production facilities belong in, whether they're commercial, agricultural, or industrial, or employment uses. Um, those bylaws can also include uh, things like maximum uh, gross floor area requirements, so at maximum absolute sizes, and coverage, uh, so percentage of the site that can be taken up. Setbacks from sensitive land uses, and you see this more and more, uh, so from residential zones and uh, or, or other, you know, hospitals, schools, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and setting standards for loading, storage, parking on site, all of which can have a very fundamental impact on, on, on what the facility ends up looking like and whether it can even locate in a specific, uh, in a specific area. Uh, municipalities are taking th different approaches to this. There are three broad categories. One is to define in the zoning bylaw what a cannabis production facility is, but not really permit it anywhere specific. And that forces an applicant to go through a site-specific rezoning process uh, to get their permission, and through that, the municipality can control what the, uh, the, the specifics of, of, of the land use on that site. The second uh, approach is to define production facilities and provide regulation in their zoning bylaws that apply to all of them. Uh, that takes a lot more forethought and uh, an anticipation of, of how you want or how a municipality wants uh, these facilities to look in their area of jurisdiction. And the third approach, which uh, you know is easiest up front but probably hardest uh, to administer, is to rely on existing zoning categories and, and fit those cannabis production facilities into the existing zoning bylaw. And that can be quite a, an awkward fit. What's also important to note if you're considering um, uh, uh, locating a facility is uh, the issue of site plan control. So municipalities have the ability through an additional bylaw called the site plan control bylaw to have uh, a separate approval process that determines how a site looks specifically and, and require the approval of plans and an agreement with the municipality which then gets registered on title. And, uh, and governs how a site does run right down to the hours of opening or when deliveries can take place uh, and which direction the lights are pointed. <clears throat> so let's turn now to retail stores. And the story here is much shorter and much simpler. And, and this is a story that changed quite fundamentally since, uh, uh, since the, the new government has come in. Uh, and that is uh, the, uh, that private sector retail stores, as you've heard from Jeremy, are going to be permitted 
um, but uh, but not where municipalities have opted out of um, private retail sales. And secondly, the Cannabis License Act indicates that municipalities don't have the authority to pass zoning bylaws that regulate the location of a retail store. And thirdly, where a bylaw was passed before um, before the act came in, that bylaw is no longer valid. It has no effect to the extent that it, it conflicts with the new legislation, which would extend to virtually every bylaw um, that's out there where a municipality was forward thinking enough to, to try to sort of get ahead of the game. Uh, the the opt-in, opt-out mechanism that the new Act um, provides for is, is an interesting one, and it requires municipalities to make some pretty fundamental decision quite quickly. There's a one-time opportunity for a municipality to opt out or prohibit cannabis retail stores from um, anywhere within its jurisdiction. It's an all-in or all-out kind of approach. You can't say, yes, it's okay in, in you know, commercial zones, not okay in, in this zone, in that zone. Um, so it has to be the municipality as a whole. That opt-out has to be passed by a council resolution before uh, the 22nd of January of next year. And if that opt-out um, is, uh, is passed, then the GCO has to automatically refuse any application for a proposed uh, retail store. Now, a municipality can later decide to lift the prohibition. Um, and that's, again, a one-time thing, because if it, if it decides to lift it, it can't then reverse itself. So it's not a situation where new councils or as winds uh, change or as impacts become apparent, the, the council can go back and forth. And you, I suppose you can see the, the, the rationale for that, because people are making business decisions based on, on those municipal decisions. Um, what's, what's important to remember is that if a municipality opts in, it still has no control over where these stores are going to be um, located. And, and this has been a fairly live uh, issue in, in a lot of municipal elections that have recently taken place. Um, some municipalities passed uh, an opt-out resolution. Richmond Hill, Markham, King Township are some examples. Some have opted in, such as North Bay. Um, <clears throat> obviously, for, for those that have opted out, if a new council comes in, or for that matter, if the same council is, is returned, but, uh, but it takes more time to study it, they have the opportunity to opt out uh, uh, later on. So, Tom, it's still, there is still some, there still has to be appropriate zoning in place for the retail location, right? It has to be retail zoning, at least. It can't be anywhere in the municipality. There's still some bit fundamental... Uh, yeah, and, that's, and that's, that's a good question. And, and at this point... Um, we don't know because municipalities don't have the ability to, to zone for retail stores. Now, the assumption is that those stores, when the, the regulations under the Act are finalized, are going to be um, located with appropriate setbacks and in appropriate zones. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's, it's, it's too early to say, Jeremy. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the, the, probably the fair answer for a lot of things when it comes to retail licensing. Yeah, and, that, and that's certainly right. And, and what's, what's, what's important to note is that under the legislation, municipalities receive a notice from the AGCO of an application for a retail store, uh, assuming that they've, that they've opted in, and that they have 15 days to make um, a written submission to the AGCO about whether the issuance of that authorization is in the public interest mm -hmm. having regard to the needs and wishes of the residents. Mm -hmm. What's interesting about the time frame is that it's real short for a municipality it because short. it's assumed in that that a municipality will solicit input from from its residents and turn around and provide that input to the AGCO. Mm -hmm. That's a very difficult thing to do in the space of two weeks in, in a fair way to, uh, to the public. No, there need to be sort of organized uh, residents associations that are ready to, sort of ready to go. But I, I can tell you that the AGCO will, you know, will take municipal input there very seriously. Sure. The, I think the challenge there, and, and it's certainly directed to do that by the legislation, to at least consider it, if not mm -hmm. follow it. Yeah. Uh, well, what's going to be a challenge is for municipalities to to advertise the issue to the public, mm -hmm. solicit input, synthesize it, and provide it to the AG seal. Uh, and uh, th th there's no, not currently a cap on the, the number of storefronts. There's uh, not certainty in respect of the minimum di separation distances that are going to be established in front of the stores. Certainly, um, the Act speaks to that to some extent, but, but not to the extent that a zoning bylaw normally would. 
Um, and, uh, and it's unclear to what extent the cannabis retail stores are going to be required to comply with municipal zoning regulations in, in terms of, you know, density, height, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. Uh, or, as we've discussed, which zones uh, mm -hmm. they're going to go into. I can, I can add, though, to that that it, it is likely, as it is with liquor licensing, that the AGCO will require uh, fire building and public health to sign off on the proposed location. Uh, in addition to whatever uh, uh, avoidance of school areas and, and other restrictions are, are added to the regulation. Right, and that's certainly a, a sensible approach. And mm -hmm. from the municipal perspective, uh, the, you know, the, the, the input from the municipality, the local circumstances are going to be different. The, the wishes of its residents and its council are going to be different, and that's going to be reflected in, uh, in its submission, but not as we've discussed, not the way it normally would be in the form of a zoning bylaw, but rather through, uh, through input to the AG seal. Uh, and the final issue that I wanted to talk about, uh, just briefly mention, if, if you're looking at, uh, if, you're, if you're an applicant, a prospective applicant looking to invest in this, is, is keep in mind that there are a lot of layers of municipal regulation. We've really just touched on this, uh, but, uh, but there is the building code to consider. Uh, for example, not to mention various fees and fees and charges that municipalities are entitled to uh, to charge. In terms of the building code, it's a very detailed document, and it deals with the structural uh, integrity and 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 sufficiency of buildings to make sure that uh, that every structure is in, uh, is in, is sufficient and safe for its intended use. That's a, an issue for retail stores. It's a big issue for production facilities because of the the physical impacts of. Uh, of, uh, of growing and, and processing, etc. Um, and I think that's it. I think I, I've used up all my time, so I'm going to, we'll come back to a couple of questions at the end if we have time. We've had a, a number of very good questions, and thank you for that, but I'll turn it over to Farouk. Okay, thank you, Tom. So I'm going to deal with uh, commercial leasing issues, and a lot of what I'll cover deals with uh, retail locations, but a lot of the issues, again, are applicable to any kind of leasing, whether you're leasing to a um, grower or, or so on. One of the key points probably is that the standard form of uh, offer to lease or the lease that the landlords know and love um, cover a lot of ground and cover a lot of standard issues but do not properly address some of the unique um, concerns that we have here. And we'll run through some of those. But to start off with respect to kind of parties, location, and rent, uh, I've been involved in a number of deals lately, initially with respect to LCBO, but now that that show has ended in Ontario with respect to cannabis, with the private kind of offers to lease for the retail locations as well. And it's becoming a classic example of kind of trying to fly the plane as you build it and, and sort of come up with solutions. Um, one of the attractive issues, obviously, to the landlord is the rent, because the tenants, in this case, they're often to pay, willing to pay market or higher than market rent for sometimes locations that are somewhat challenging, which is great, and the landlords then are coming on board. But having said that, they're willing to you know bend but not break, and they still want to keep some of their typical uh, issues resolved. So in this case, uh, if you have a shell company that's applying for the license and it's brand new, technically the landlord still has to be covered and get appropriate security. Get the, they, they may want indemnify or security deposit letter of credits or all the standard stuff. Um, what's going to sort of, again, horse before the cart kind of thing is where the licenses are going to be issued in April of next year, and everyone is trying to lock in the actual locations now. So what happens? I mean, again, everything we'll talk about boils down to the leverage, the location, and how badly the parties want each other in this case. So, for example, the landlords, to make sure that they don't get a haircut through this, will make sure that the term or the commencement date or the rent commencement date really sort of makes sense. 
So how do you do that now if you're trying to lock it in? Well, there's few solutions. Some landlords say, look, I, I want the binding deal starting now and you pay me rent now and uh, like oh, your whole licensing thing kind of, I, I don't care. We can be a bit flexible on your use if you don't get the license, but I want this locked in at this rent now, which becomes a bit scary for a retailer who doesn't know what's going to happen. The other solution is that I've seen where they'll make the deal conditional. And it's conditional until April or, or sooner until getting the license. And then at that point, you get to sort of start fixturing the space and moving along because you got your comfort only then. But the landlord will say, well, hold on a second. Again, what, what happens if you don't get a license? Well, the solutions to that are so few. Some will say, Pay me a certain amount of deposit. It's usually much larger than everyone is used to. And then if you don't get your license, I get to keep the deposit. So that the sort of risk is addressed. Or pay, start paying me rent now so I get certain rent flow now. And then we'll like, when that happens again, maybe I'll keep part of the deposit or so on. But those are some of, some of the options. Um, and again, if like from the tenant's perspective, you might want to have a termination right at some point if you don't get a license after a certain amount of time that you get to walk so that the landlord got some of the rent. Either way, you see what I'm getting at. It's up to negotiation, and it sort of varies on sort of location. Um, one of the very, very important issues, especially for landlord, from landlord's perspective, is before you even jump on board, is to check with certain like third parties that, they, that have their hand in the whole show. And for example, your existing lenders might have, arguably, prohibitions of some kind where they don't want this type of use. Now, up to now, it wasn't common practice within mortgage documents to specify you shall not have cannabis retailer because no one thought of that. But it could have general language that falls within something that could be interpreted to prevent that use. And either way, you do not want to be offside of your mortgage documents, so check on that. Related to that, some lenders who are not all warm and fuzzy on it already said, look, we're not going to give you that non-disturbance agreement that the tenant wants. I'm telling you now, for can if you want to grow asparagus, fine, but cannabis, no. So it sort of it depends on the lender. So just check before you sort of jump in. Uh, another important sort of third party in all of this is the existing tenants. Again, some of the bigger uh, chain family type tenants, and I've seen examples of pet stores who have families coming in, and it's very important to them that a shopping plaza does not have any kind of use that's in their eyes inappropriate or what have you. And some of them, some of the U.S. tenants out of Colorado who actually have this experience specifically say, you will not have a cannabis retailer next to me. I just don't want that. So you have to check your existing leases, A, for specific language, and B, for something general about immoral use or something that brings the shopping center in a light that they don't want. Whatever it is, check. Again, insurance, another third party. You've got to check with your insurer, see what this will do, what, how it will affect costs, how you'll pass them through, and so on. And then we move on to sort of permitted use. Again, it's obvious, yet I've seen offers from landlords that are missing this. Uh, you cannot open a retail location without a license, and I need evidence that you have it, that it's in your name, and that you can legally do this. For landlords out there, keep in mind that if you don't make sure, technically permitting this use without a license is having a criminal operation, mm -hmm. and you, by accepting rent, could be argued are getting proceeds of crime. Landlords don't like hearing that they are part of any sort of criminal thing, so make sure you're not. Um, 
strict compliance with the laws so is going to be in pretty much any lease. Uh, but another thing related to Tom, what Tom was saying is, again, leases will have typical language that say, I, landlord, am not making any representations or warranties with respect to your use and zoning and all of that. Go satisfy yourself, and then if it's all good, knock yourself out. Um, the leases are going to need enhanced provisions dealing with nuisance, odors, vapors, effect on common areas. How, like, because that, again, is something that no one can quite predict on whether the customers are going to hang around and smoke around whatever parking common areas, even though they're not allowed. It might create this thing that you don't want, and then what? How do you deal with that? What if there's costs associated, associated with that? With respect to additional cost, really, you'll want a provision that says anything that's resulting out of your use tenant that I'm now incurring, I'll have to pass on uh, to you. Another thing, again, related to use is the exclusive use. Now, what I've seen is these retail tenants saying, hey, I'm going to be the only one selling cannabis. Again, based on leverage and the location, landlords will consider what, if anything, they'll give you. But if they're giving something, again, from landlord's perspective, keep in mind that this should really be for principal use of retail sales for consumption. Because when you think about it, of, of whether it's plants or whether it's for smoking or whatever, you might want to define it because when you think about it, regulation is going to come out where there will be edibles and drinkables and cannabis incorporated into all kinds of products. And then you have hemp and clothing and whatever. So by saying anything that has to do with it, it might be too restrictive. So you don't want to handcuff yourself um, way too much. Another issue has to do with signage, advertising, appearance. Again, this is typical in every lease. Again, depending on the location, but the landlords are often very, very strict about how it's going to look and feel and so on, and they want to control this, which is normal. However, suggestion at the early stages for some of the tenants out there is to have kind of renderings and designs ready even in advance because if you can show this, you can get the landlord on board a uh, little easier and they'll be a little more interested because some of the comments I've heard from the landlord is they're just worried. They, they don't know what this will look like and feel like and I've heard comparisons to some of the liquor stores in Alberta that aren't the best looking and we don't want that and that sort of thing. So. That's something to keep in mind. Alterations, again, the landlords will control what can happen and how. You might, as a tenant, try to negotiate what kind of alterations, if any, you can do without consent. But the, related to that is removal and restoration, which can be very costly. So at the end of the term, the tenants will need to put certain installations in there that will affect you know, securely storing your inventory. So you might have to put a vault in. And if you do, then what happens at the end? The landlord might find that useful if their next tenant is operating a jewelry store, less useful for a pizza store because securing mozzarella isn't <laughs> as important. And then the cost of that to depends remove who, it. Depends on who you're talking well, to. Well, I guess. That's true, <laughs> Jeremy. Uh, but anyway, the point is the cost could be significant and you've got to deal with, with removal as well. Um, access and distress, like here's an important and unique issue here. Landlords are so used to having all out right to go into the space at any time, and if you're not there, they'll go in, let themselves in, do whatever they need, and, and also have their distress rate. So if you don't pay your rent, they can come in, take your property, sell it, and make up the arrear in rent. It just doesn't work for a cannabis retail uh, operation practically. Again, there's regulation here, and one of the things that tenants have to make sure, which is reasonable, is that the landlord now can do something that will put your license in jeopardy. Uh, they also certainly can't sell cannabis without a license through distress, so that has to be adjusted accordingly. 
And my final point is um, with respect to termination rights. Again, from the landlord's perspective, there are certain grounds on which it absolutely makes sense to keep this in mind. Uh, one is if the tenant fails to comply with laws, if they don't have a license, lose their license, whatever it is, the show has to end right there. And they, there's not really going to be much argument on that one. In the event, again, if there's change of laws, we don't anticipate any, but we clearly live in an environment where of change, and who knows, if there's change of laws or prohibition on this, or if the landlord really is in breach of any laws or requirements, again, it makes sense for the landlord to terminate. I've also seen landlords trying to like add additional grounds on which they can terminate, and these ones, depending on what it is, are subject to negotiation. But the gist of it is the landlords are trying to say, look, new to me, I don't know what, like I kind of have an idea what it will be like, but if three years from now it turns out that this is like the worst decision of my life and everything is not what I thought and it's just affecting everyone else, then, and my other tenants, then I, I want a way out. Again, tenants will spend money going in, so that one is a bit loose and it needs to be properly defined and sort of set out, but it's, again, something to keep in mind. Um, that is all I have, and um, I guess now we can maybe turn to some of the questions. Yeah, it looks like we've, we've gotten a lot of questions in. Um, I, I have a couple, I don't know, Tom, do you want, I have a couple that I, I thought I could tackle. There's, it's really difficult to uh, cover everything now, but um, one question asks about the restriction on licensed producers uh, having more than one retail location in Ontario and whether there's been any softening on that position. Um, the answer is we don't know yet. The, 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 the the, the way it works is the definition of affiliate, which is, which is what potentially gives the opportunity for corporations related to licensed producers to open uh, their own retail locations. That definition hasn't been determined yet. It'll, come, it'll be published in the regulations when the regulations under the Provincial Cannabis License Act are uh, released uh, next month or, or later. Um, but I can tell you that there's certainly been uh, lobbying on behalf of uh, licensed producers for that definition to be broad, to allow them opportunities to open more than one retail location, which currently has to be tied to their production facility. Um, so that, that remains to be determined. Uh, another one asks about uh, whether uh, corporations such as Loblaws or other large corporations looking to sell cannabis would have to comply with the same uh, rules for licensing? Absolutely, they would. Uh, the, the important point there is that um, every particular location for uh, retail in Ontario has to be separately licensed. You need a store authorization for each location. So the, the framework is Loblaws as a corporation or, or whatever uh, large corporation um, would obtain a retail operator license, but then it would need to obtain a separate store author authorization for each store. Um, those were a couple that are easy to answer off the top of my head. A th oh, quick third one. Is it possible to operate a private smoking club uh, if there's no landlord or property issue? Um, probably not is the answer. The, the rules on where you can consume cannabis are, or smoke cannabis in particular, um, uh, depend on the prescriptions in the Smoke-Free Ontario Act. So uh, because you're not allowed to smoke indoors um, in, in most places, you'd have the same issue with smoking cannabis. And I can address four questions at, at one time. So uh, thank you for all the, the many questions you've sent us. Um, the questions that, we, that I think I can group here are, can a municipality not allow cannabis growing operations what is the impact on the agricultural land base? Can growth be done commercially on industrial lands? And as a sort of adjunct to that, does the potential regulation of growing operations fit within the protections from municipal interference under the Farming and Food Production Protection Act, i.e. normal farm practice? So broadly, and this is a topic that, that can be dealt with in an hour-long seminar in itself, but um, broadly, it's it's 
quite possible for a municipality to prohibit um, growing operations in some or all of its zones. The snag there from the municipality's perspective, whatever decision it takes, is that that kind of a prohibition, of course, can be challenged because it's a, it's a zoning matter and, and any zoning matter can be challenged under the Planning Act through an appeal. Uh, if it's appealed, then, then uh, you know, both sides are going to have to um, argue out whether there is consistency with the provincial policy statement, conformity with various provincial plans, how does the whole thing uh, conform or not conform to the official plan. So, it's, so the answer is yes, but. Uh, <clears throat> and in terms of how um, these are zoned and where they're zoned for, um, this goes back to the point that I was making about uh, the, the, the um, struggle that I think municipalities are having or debate that they're having in terms of whether um, production facilities or agricultural uses, industrial uses, some, some hybrid or commercial use. And that, uh, from my perspective, depends very much on, on specifically what's happening on site, whether the growth is, is taking place on site or whether and to what extent versus processing or whether it's purely a processing facility. And finally, um, I assuming that we're talking about a, a facility that is primarily a growth facility or at least largely a growth facility, um, the issue of the Farming and Food Production Protection Act and, and the potential oversight by the Normal Farm Practices Protection Board, as arcane as it sound, is actually as it sounds, is actually quite a, a large issue because there is a statute in Ontario that that protects, uh, you know, for, for lack of a better word, bona fide farmers and normal farm practices uh, from interference uh, and uh, restriction by municipal bylaws. So that that is certainly a, I think, uh, an argument for uh, that'll uh, that'll be tried. Um, th there is broad protection from the application of municipal bylaws for normal farm practices, but someone will have to show that in fact their growth operation, their production facility is both a farm operation and that what they're engaging in is a normal farm practice and then they can arguably uh, receive protection from the application of, uh, of municipal bylaws. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. I have a question because a lot of what I covered dealt with sort of retail locations and one of the questions is what are the issues of sort of for growers and sort of uh, industrial sites producing cannabis. Now, some of them already, the issues about the license in April for sale doesn't apply. Some of these already have licenses to produce. And while many issues are the same, some are unique to sort of industrial sites. So you're not going to be as concerned about the signage and appearance if it's an industrial site in suburbs the way a retail landlord would. But you'll still have the same issues about the third parties, about security, about installations and restoration and removal at the end of the term. Things like that would apply. Um, again, you usually it's a single tenancy and a large facility that's usually self-managed. So you don't have actually as many concerns about effects on other tenants in common areas and all of the other stuff. Um, so it's sort of, there's less to sort of worry about, but again, the unique things about third parties and lenders and um, installations, restoration, all apply. Great. So I think that uh, uh, brings us right up to the end of the hour. I should uh, point out that we have another uh, webinar scheduled for Thursday, November 1st. Uh, on workplace law and um, I think that sort of oh it's not a webinar sorry that's what I was being told it's not a webinar it's a summit <laughs> apologies even better yeah more even better than a webinar um, so uh, please feel free to look at that the the registration link for that summit are is should be in the resources pane on your screen um, along with some other resources uh, that you can uh, look into if you'd like, including our bios and links to the cannabis group at the Erden Burles. 
Um, and I understand that the materials, uh, uh, this, um, this PDF will be available uh, sometime next week for download if you like. And obviously don't hesitate to reach out to us if you have uh, other questions. I apologize we weren't able to tackle nearly, you know, only a small fraction of the questions that uh, came in. Um, so uh, we hope we can uh, speak to some of you afterwards. Um, thank you very much. And uh, those are our, uh, that's our contact information in case you'd like to contact us. And uh, Farouk and Tom, thanks very much. And I thought that was really interesting. And hope maybe we'll get to do another one. Sure. For sure. Thank you, everybody, for your attention Thanks. this morning.